Good evening, all. Welcome to our inaugural Regis Pride Faculty Lecture Series. This year's theme is the pandemic and systemic racism. Why do harsh disparities continue to exist? My name is Mary Lou Jackson, and I am the assistant to the president for at Regis College. I welcome all attendees here tonight, including our students, our faculty, our staff, our board of trustees, our alums, our Lark students, and friends of the college. Allow me to go over a few Zoom details. This lecture is being recorded. All participants have been muted so that we do not get a lot of background noise. For the first hour, Professor Hogan will share his lecture, Mercy, Mercy Me, A Glimpse into Environmental Racism. For this portion, we ask that you stop your videos and use speaker view for your screen. Following the lecture, we will use the remaining time to answer questions or share comments. You're welcome to turn your videos back on then. Please use the chat box during the lecture to ask questions or share comments that you might have. We will try to get to many, as many questions and comments as possible after the lecture. I will now introduce Dr. Shannon Hogan. Dr. Hogan received his PhD in virology from the University of New Hampshire. He then entered industry and worked for 14 years de developing diagnostic essays for a disease that affect livestock and companion animals. From there, he co-developed technology used to identify oncology and autoimmune therapeutics. He also developed technology to improve influenza vaccine production. Dr. Hogan then moved back to academia and has taught at Emanuel College, Boston College, Harvard Medical School, and fortunately now Regis College. Here he teaches a variety of biology classes such as virology and environmental microbiology. He also teaches laboratory operations management courses, which focus on and are successful in getting students employment in the industrial and academic sectors. He runs an independent study program where students perform experiments with bacterial viruses, act as teaching assistants, and assist in developing curricula for the STEM department. Recently, Dr. Hogan was named the professor of record for Regis's newly designed interdisciplinary COVID-19 pandemic course, Living and Dying Through a Pandemic. It is with great pride and pleasure I introduce to you, Dr. Shannon Hogan. Thanks, Mary Lou. So good evening, everyone. Um, you could be wondering why, why is a virologist going to give me information uh, that surrounds uh, environmental racism, and it's one of, one of the answers I'm actually going to have tonight. Um, so basically what happened was we had an all-faculty meeting this summer, and our chief diversity officer, who's Audrey Grace, who is am amazing for many reasons, um, said, you know, what would be really great is if you could incorporate, you know, racial disparity, topics about racism, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, any of this information into your courses where you don't normally have this information, it would be really great uh, to one, educate yourself on these matters and two, educate your students on these matters. I mean, you could act as a teacher, that's why we're paying you all this money. So, so I did that and, and I was teaching a class called environmental racism, uh, environmental, excuse me, environmental microbiology. And environmental microbiology uh, is, a, is a great course, it's a wonderful course, but we don't talk about racial disparities and things like that. Um, in the course. And so I did something, I, I went ahead and I typed in the word environmental racism. And I was like, I, I wonder, I wonder if environmental racism is, is a thing. And, and, and it turns out um, I was incredibly naive. Of course it is. Um, in fact, environmental racism is, 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 doesn't just speak to the fact that, you know, anthropogenic or man-made toxins and pollutants disproportionately affect people of color. Um, it's actually a subtopic that's part of a larger movement called the environmental justice movement. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. So, so that's sort of my journey. Um, this is not an all encompassing uh, talk by any means. In fact, it's more of a primer. Uh, and again, it's more about sort of my journey through the literature and finding out more and more about environmental racism. And then instead of incorporating this material into lectures that I already had for this course, I went ahead and I decided to make it its own lecture and then Mary Lou found out about it and now we're all here right now. So 
I think I'm sharing my screen, but if I'm not, I have to make sure. There we go. Um, and so again, the topic is environmental racism. Again, how man-made factors such as pollutants and toxins and things like that, you know, disproportionately affect people of color. And if you're gonna look into this information, you're gonna find this guy and his name is Robert D. Bullard. And he is literally nicknamed uh, the father of environmental justice. And if you go to his website, you are going to find resource after resource after resource about this material. It's a great jumping off point. Uh, and, and he's been around for a long time and he's been doing this work exclusively for, for an awfully long period of time. And so he has many quotes and I chose to use this quote. I know you can read, but I'm gonna read it anyways. And it says, whether by conscious design or institutional neglect, communities of color in urban ghettos, in rural poverty pockets, or in economically impoverished Native American reservations face some of the worst environmental devastation in the nation. And that, that, is, that is, unfortunately, that is true. And I think it serves as a good jumping off point uh, for this talk. And so what did I do? So I Googled environmental racism and again, found out this is a thing. And then I sort of went deeper and said, you know, well, where else can we go from here? And I found that there was something known as environmental health disparity. And so I went ahead and I did like anybody else would. I used the Google and I found that there's a governmental organization known as the NIEHS and they look into environmental health disparity. Uh, the EPA actually has a website as well. And so if you go to Google images after, you know, typing in environmental health disparity, one thing I found was that the first two images that come up are this image and this image. And I was like, that's odd because I don't see a person of color. Maybe I'm missing something, but I don't see a person of color in either one of these images that are from websites that surround environmental health disparity or a subtopic of environmental racism. And so it sort of shook my head and said, well, there must be some data in here. And lo and behold, there, there, there was. And so I sort of cherry picked a few pieces of data. I'm gonna go into a lot more data in just a bit, but I sort of cherry picked a few pieces of data and I saw that in 2017, you had 12.6% of black children were diagnosed with asthma compared to 7.7% of white children. And we know that asthma is potentially a multifactorial illness, but we know that one of the major components is exposure to toxins and pollutants. And we also know that people of color are exposed more readily or more openly to toxins and pollutants and stuff because they stuff and things because they live, they're more likely to live near a toxic waste facility. They're more likely to live near a coal fired um, plant of some sort or, or something like that. And then it, it gets worse, right? It, you look into it and you see that Latinx children are twice as likely to be diagnosed with asthma. Again, overwhelmingly uh, it, it, in the literature, if you look through it, you're going to find that pollutants and toxins and all sorts of stuff like that are, are major factors when it, when it comes to, to asthma. And so I went a little bit deeper and I saw that you know, looking at say a cardiovascular response, 42% of black adults that are over 20 are hyper, uh, hypertensive as compared to 20.7% of white adults. And this obviously has something not only to do with environment, but also, also with food disparity and, and many other factors that disproportionately affect people of color. And so being a scientist, I said, well, there's gotta be data. Right, there's, I mean, there's gotta be more than just this data right here. There's gotta be more data. And so what I ended up doing was, I ended up kind of crossing through a number of .edu sites and starting to read some of the literature, the journal articles and, and such that were out there. And I noticed that there were three common topics when you talked about environmental racism. There were three common topics that had a lot of data in them. And so I went towards that, again, being a scientist, and I found that lead poisoning is, is, is one of the, the topics where there's a lot of data surrounding environmental racism. And what I found was that when you're talking about housing, especially housing that was built pre-1946, a lot of the paint that's on the inside of these houses, particularly near the windows and such, contains lead. And we know that lead ingestion in humans is obviously a bad thing. It can lead to different cardiovascular issues. It can lead to acute and chronic neurological issues, and these affect children more so than adults. And you know, when I say children, I mean these, you know, the little people that are running around everywhere, you know what they are. They are more likely to go ahead and put things in their mouths. Somehow that evolutionarily was a way that humans would survive. We would explore with our mouths early on. And so kids are putting, you know, paint and, uh, in their mouth and they're, they're inhaling 
the dust from the paint, and they're getting lead inside of them. And children also uh, not only are ex more exposed to lead paint because of this, but they're also more likely to absorb the lead from the paint. And so if you look at children that live in this housing, if you look at 22% of African-American children and 13% of Mexican-American children that live in this type of housing where lead paint is predominant, especially around windows and doorways and things like that, okay, you see that they're lead poisoned in some way, shape or form, either acutely or chronically, versus 6% of white children okay, are lead poisoned that live in similar housing like this. And you start to wonder, is this a socioeconomic factor? It's not cheap to you know, remove uh, lead-based paint and have it painted over and, and, and such. So is there a socioeconomic, not just an environmental, but a socioeconomic disparity there as well. And so one of the other major factors that you find a lot of data on is toxic waste. And lo and behold, we're going to go back to Robert D. Bullard, again, the, the father of environmental justice. And he did a 20-year study where he showed, okay, that if you're in a host neighborhood, you're in an area, okay, that's three kilometers from a top, top excuse me, toxic waste site, you're much more likely to be a person of color. In fact, race is the strongest predictor for whether or not you live three kilometers from a toxic waste site, more so than any other socioeconomic factor that he looked at. And then he went a little bit further and he looked at clusters of facilities. So these are areas where there's more than one toxic waste site. And he found that greater than two thirds of people that live near these clusters are people of color. This isn't just by chance, okay? This is set up this way, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later on in the talk. He also found that African Americans are about 80% more likely than whites to live in neighborhoods where pollution is suspected to be a health-related issue. That's 80% more likely. Again, this is not by chance. By any means is this by chance. And so the third factor that looked into, that a lot of people look into where there's a lot of data is toxic emissions. And this goes back to coal-fired power plants. Coal plants release coal dust and all sorts of gases such as nit excuse me, nitrogen dioxide that are very detrimental to people's health. And so some of the data out there, I just picked a few things that I found from some of the more prominent journal articles. It says that greater than 68% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal-fired plant. Okay, this is data that we've had for, for years. We know that this isn't, again, just by chance. Greater than 68% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal-powered plant. These are people breathing in nitrogen dioxide, which causes neurologic and respiratory issues, coal dust, all sorts of other emissions. And we know, I'll say it once, I'll say it again, we know that asthma has a link in environmental pollutants. And then something I'm gonna show you a little bit later when we actually run through um, a portion of the lecture is I'm gonna show you how housing, which is set up predominantly for people of color, okay, is located very, very close to places where they emit different types of toxins from these fuel stacks that you see in these pictures that we showed earlier. And so you're sitting there and you're saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm a public health major, I'm a social work major, I'm some sort of healthcare major, and I've got to hear it from this guy who studies viruses. Uh, and I, he's going to tell me something about environmental racism and the data that, that sort of follows that. And so I'll say, fine, don't listen to me, listen to the experts. And I'm, I picked three of my favorites um, that I ended up finding. And one of them is Dr. David Williams, and he has a TED Med talk called How Racism Makes Us Sick. And it's a fantastic talk. If you don't know what TED Med talks, please go look at them. They're, they're, they're wonderfully informative in a lot of ways. And this one in particular, and, and he found something that I found quite staggering. He said that if you look at, look at the United States and look at 171 of the largest cities in the US, 171 of the largest cities in the US, and he found that not one of them, not one of those 171 has blacks living under the same conditions as whites. And then he went further, so I'm sort of taking, paraphrasing quotes and such, and he went further, okay, and he said that even if you look at the worst living conditions that whites experience, they're still better than the average living conditions that black communities experience in these 171 cities. Again, this is not by chance. And so I sort of switched gears a little bit 
and I went to one of the other experts and her name is Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones and, and she's impressive in a lot of ways. And one way I find her to be very impress impressive is, is she doesn't just tackle this from, from one area, right? She sort of multitasks and she looks at something called green spaces. And what green spaces are is there are these, there are these areas where people plant trees and flowers and grass and such. And it not only looks better, but it also provides cooling because plants go through a process, it's part of their water cycle, and it's called transpira transpiration, basically. And what it is, is it's plants cooling down the environment naturally. They sort of act like a natural air conditioner. And so what you find is, if you look in inner cities, you find less of these green spaces in areas where there are predominantly people of color. And so what ends up happening is they experience higher temperatures because they have less of these green spaces, which would naturally cool the area off. And so her point is we need to build more of these. And she's got data and you look at areas that are in New York City that have people of color predominantly living in these areas, their temperature in the summer can be seven degrees hotter than surrounding areas which do have these green spaces. And so she goes a little bit further and she says, let's look at food. And she looks at obesity and, the fa and, and, and cardiac issues and diabetes issues and kidney issues and the fact that people of color are disproportionately able to get good food. And then she goes one more further and she looks at COVID. She looks right now and she says, if you look at SARS-CoV-2, you look at the virus that infects people that causes this pandemic, that's COVID-19, you can see it's very obvious that for a number of different reasons, people of color are disproportionately infected by this particular virus. There is a definite link from environmental factors or environmental racism to health disparity as well. And so that got me thinking even more and said, well, how does it link to health disparity? And I end up finding the prophet of Latino healthcare. And his name is Dr. David Hayes Batista. And he too has a website that's very, very impressive. If this interests you in the slightest, please go to his website. It, 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 it's phenomenal. And, and he, the cool thing about this guy is he doesn't just look at environmental racism and health disparity and such. He looks at it also, not just from an ethical standpoint, but he looks at it from a more objective standpoint. And he says, healthcare companies, health insurance companies, okay? Why do we keep having Latinos being the least insured population that there is in this country? You don't understand. When you're looking at insurance pools, when you're looking at insurance risk pools, okay? You've got a lot of young, healthy Latino people that could give you a lot of data and so you could more effectively sort of complete that healthcare triangle, right? You could deliver healthcare more readily and cheaper and have it be better healthcare. You could have more data. He's looking at this very scientifically and he moves it further even in with recent immigrants and undocumented immigrants. These are a lot of people. You could use a lot of this healthcare data, which is a billion dollar industry, and you could use it for good. You could use it to deliver better and better healthcare to a wider view of population, but you're not choosing to do that. So again, Latino healthcare or the lack of insurance not only affects Latinos, obviously, but it affects healthcare in general because of the lack of data you're getting because of the so many that are uninsured. And so what is environmental racism? I decided that I would look it up and see what YouTube had to say. And so I did so. Many times when we think of racism, we tend to think of direct actions of people of a dominant group towards a subordinate group. These actions tend to cause physical, mental, and emotional harm. But perhaps one of the most subtle forms of racism is environmental racism. Environmental racism is the way which minority groups are burdened with a disproportionate number of hazards, including toxic waste facilities, garbage dumps, and other sources of environmental pollution. This type of racism is quietly practiced through the passing of bills and laws that allow companies such as coal plants, landfills, and toxic waste facilities to be built in places that are disproportionately in areas where low income and people of color live. These facilities fill the air with harmful contaminants and lead to health issues. But what does this really look like? Environmental racism can be seen in people drinking contaminated groundwater, 
children playing on school playgrounds next to a plant producing toxic emissions, people being exposed to asbestos and lead in older homes and schools, or corporations attempting to build nuclear waste dumps on protected native lands because those lands are not protected by tough state environmental regulations. Coal power plants are some of the worst offenders, and according to a recent NAACP report, 39% of people that live within three miles of a coal power plant are people of color, and those coal plants that are in urban areas are overwhelmingly placed in communities of color. Worldwide, the dumping of toxic waste in developing countries is prevalent due to lower environmental standards in developing countries. The power of multinational corporations the lack of power in developing countries, and putting corporate profit before people. E-waste, or the dumping of discarded and used electronics, is causing a global concern too. 20 to 50 million tons of e-waste are generated each year globally, and approximately 80% of e-waste is exported to Asia each year. The Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, estimates that only 15 to 20% of e-waste is recycled yearly. Examples of health issues related to environmental racism include asthma and respiratory illnesses, lead poisoning, and higher rates of lung cancer in those living within close proximity to coal-producing plants. The highest rates of asthma tend to be in low socioeconomic communities and communities of color. Asthma results from exposure to air pollution, cigarette smoke, dust, and pesticides. According to the Center for Disease Control, or CDC, Asthma is most prevalent among multiracial populations at 14.8%, Puerto Rican Hispanics at 14.2%, non-Asian Blacks at 9.5%, while asthma rates among non-Hispanic whites is at 7.8%. When it comes to exposure to air pollution that can contribute to asthma and other respiratory illnesses, the CDC found that racial and ethnic minority groups who tend to live in urban areas experience greater disparity in illness. Toxic facilities tend to be built in environments that have little resources and political power to protect the communities. The Environmental Protection Agency is meant to help protect the environment and people from the harmful effects of facilities, but has proven to be unresponsive. According to the Center for Public Integrity, more than nine of every 10 times that communities have turned to it for help, the EPA has either rejected or dismissed their Title VI complaints. Title VI is part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that states public funds cannot be used to encourage discrimination. In the EPA's 22-year history of processing almost 300 environmental discrimination complaints, the office has never once made a formal finding of a Title VI violation, and 95% of the time, communities of color that live in communities with polluting facilities have their filed claims of civil rights violations denied by the Environmental Protection Agency. This is a complicated picture, and our dependence on energy production and electronics makes it difficult to walk away from. But that shouldn't mean that disproportionate numbers of lower socioeconomic groups and people of color should have to pay the higher price. So, what other examples of environmental racism can you think of that impact you or your community? So, so what I wanted to do there was um, not just take up some time with a, with a video, but um, I wanted just to show you that sort of everything, it's sort of a nice synopsis of, of what I was saying previously about the effects of pollutants, about the fact that people of color are more likely to live in areas that are more highly polluted and that you can see there's starting to be a causal effect and there definitely is a causal effect uh, on the fact that if you live closer to pollutants, you're more likely to have children that are asthmatic or even become asthmatic as an adult. So it was a nice sort of synopsis to, to the first half of the lecture um, that I gave. And I sort of wanna move now and change direction a little bit and, and talk about the history of environmental racism. And I'm gonna have one more video and then I promise it's gonna be, it's gonna be all me. Um, but I thought this was a very interesting video and I had no idea that this even existed. Again, I'm very clueless when it comes to this sort of stuff here. Who lives in a poor neighborhood. I'm sorry. This is Jamal. Jamal is a boy who lives in a poor neighborhood. He has a friend named Kevin who lives in a wealthy neighborhood. All of Jamal's neighbors are African-American, 
and all of Kevin's neighbors are white. Because Jamal's school district is mostly funded by property taxes, his school is not very well funded. His classrooms are overcrowded, his teachers are underpaid, and he doesn't have access to high quality tutors or extracurricular activities. Kevin's school district is also funded by property taxes, so his school is very well funded. His classrooms are never crowded, his teachers are very well paid, and he has access to high quality tutors and lots of extracurricular activities. Kevin and Jamal live only a few streets away from each other. So how come they're growing up in such different worlds with such different opportunities for success? Doug! That is not what I thought would happen. The answer has to do with America's history of systemic racism. To understand it better, Let's look at what life was like for Kevin and Jamal's grandparents. Decades after the Civil War, many government agencies started to draw maps dividing cities into sections that were either desirable or undesirable for investment. This practice was called redlining, and it usually blocked off entire black neighborhoods from access to private and public investment. Banks and insurance companies used these maps for decades to deny black people loans and other services based purely on race. Historically speaking, Owning a home and getting a college education is the easiest way for an American family to build wealth. But when Jamal's grandparents wanted to buy a house, the banks refused because they lived in a neighborhood that was redlined. So Jamal's grandparents were not able to buy a home, and because colleges could prevent them from attending through legal segregation, their options for higher education were really scarce. Kevin's grandparents, on the other hand, got a low interest loan to buy their first house and got accepted into a handful of top universities, which traditionally only accepted white students. This opened up a wealth of opportunities that they were able to pass on to their kids and grandkids. Even as late as the 1980s, an investigation into the Atlanta real estate market showed that banks were more willing to lend to low-income white families than to middle or upper-income African-American families. As a result, today, for every $100 of wealth held by a white family, black families have $5.04. A 2017 study confirms that redlining is still affecting home values in major cities like Chicago today. This explains how Kevin and Jamal inherited vastly different circumstances. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. A big part of systemic racism is implicit bias. These are prejudices in society that people are not aware that they have. Let's go back to Kevin and Jamal. Against all odds, Jamal manages to be the only student from his high school to get accepted into a great university, the same one that Kevin and his high school friends are attending. But after Kevin and Jamal both graduate, Jamal notices that his resume isn't drawing as much interest as Kevin's, even though they graduated from the same program with the exact same GPA. Unfortunately for Jamal, studies show that resumes with white-sounding names get twice as many callbacks as identical resumes with black-sounding names. Implicit bias is one of the reasons why the black unemployment rate is twice the rate of white unemployment, even among college graduates today. You can see evidence of systemic racism in every area of life. The disparities in family wealth, incarceration rates, political representation, and education are all examples of systemic racism. Unfortunately, the biggest challenge with systemic racism is that there's no single person or entity responsible for it, which makes it very hard to solve. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is work towards becoming more aware of your own implicit biases. What are some prejudices that you might hold that you're not aware of? Second, let's acknowledge that the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow laws are still affecting access to opportunity today. As a result, we should support systemic changes that create more equal opportunities for everyone. Increasing public school funding and making it independent from property taxes would be a great start so that poor and wealthy districts can receive equal access to resources. Sources. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Luckily, we're all part of the system, which means that we all have a role to play in making it better. Peace. Twice as many callbacks Oops, as I... So, sort of translating back into the history, you look a little bit further and you see, you know, well, what was done after that? And the idea was, well, let's be colorblind. Let's go ahead and say, I don't see color and we'll create all sorts of policies that make everybody equal. And the problem with doing that is, is that you're denying that racism, racism and the effects of racism existed before then. You can't just say, okay, now we'll be colorblind. And so that led obviously to more and more discussion 
around environmental justice that was partially born out of the civil rights movement in the 1960s and started gaining some traction in the 1970s. And then in the 1980s, you saw the first time where the word environmental racism was actually used. And the reason it was used was because there was this company that had oil that was contaminated with PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, which are known to be toxins to humans and they're known to be carcinogens as well. And they said, oh no, we have all this oil that's contaminated with these PCBs, what shall we do with it? Well, instead of going to the EPA and saying, how do we clean this up? What they decided to do was, they decided to take this, this oil and put it in tankers and at night or the early hours in the morning, they decided to drive down highways in North Carolina pulled when there was no traffic around, pull the trucks over and leak out the contaminated oil into the soil that was next to where the road was. And they did this for about 240 miles or so, just pulling over when no one was around, leaking the oil into the soil and then moving on forward at, again, all hours of the night and, and the morning and such. And lo and behold, somebody caught them. And that somebody was the EPA. And they said, you can't do this. In fact, two people that spearheaded the whole thing went to jail. And they said, we need to clean this up. And so they decided to go ahead and pull up all this soil, 120 million pounds of it and say, what should we do? It's contaminated with these known toxins and carcinogens and such. And they said, without any sort of scientific data behind it, they made a decision that they would dump it in Warren County, North Carolina. Warren County, North Carolina happens to, happened to be at the time, the place that had the highest concentration of people of color. There were 69% people of color in this. And the people of Warren found out about this and said, absolutely not. We don't want this. There's no value to you doing this other than you're getting it out of your communities and putting it into ours. And so people actually physically laid down in the street to block trucks that were coming in. It was the largest civil disobedience act in Southern US since Dr. King marched in Alabama. And the EPA came back and said, no, you got to trust us. Here's what's going to happen. We're totally going to dump this soil in your area. You have enough land to do this. It won't affect your water supply. It won't affect your health. And it's going to get even better. We're going to go ahead and we're going to clean it up. And they did clean it up. They did decontaminate it. It took them about 20 years or so, but they actually did end up cleaning it up. And so fast forward to the GAO or General Accounting Office in 1983. And this is where they said, look, we understand this is a nationwide level study. We understand that African Americans are more likely to live near waste sites. They're more likely to experience environmental racism. They're more likely to inhale or ingest toxins or vapors or anything that could be harmful to, to humans. And so there was actually the first nationwide study in 1990, look at that, Robert Bullard back again, dumping in Dixie, said not only is this happening, but it's happening, see the key word here, it's happening because communities of color are being targeted. And so an environmental, or excuse me, an executive order came out, okay, and it said, the goal is going to be, we need to protect communities, we need to protect people of color, we need to protect them from these toxins and the health conditions that can occur because of it. And the EPA said one further, you know what, we're actually gonna make this a focus. We're gonna make this a focus. We're gonna say environmental racism exists and we're gonna figure out ways to not only address it, but to keep it from happening further and to maybe el eliminate it if, if possible. So that's, that's the 1990s. And they sort of held true on their profit and in their promise in 2010, in 2010, the EPA said, okay, environmental justice, it's a priority now. We're going to have grants, we're going to have all sorts of money, we're going to have all sorts of resources, and we're going to put it towards environmental racism, or less specifically, towards environmental justice. And we're going to, to make this an actual focus for the EPA, even though you know, it's, fi it's finally now to 2010. And so one of the things they funded was this thing called the EJ screen. And what it did um, back in the day was it allowed you to map, it allowed you to overlay various types of maps. And so you could see sort of what the effect was of environmental racism or less specifically environmental justice on the community. And so what you can do is you can still do this to this day. You can go ahead and put this in and it'll locate you. It knows that I'm in Massachusetts. Oh, come on. Okay. Sorry, I've got about a billion things open on my computer right now. And so I'm just going to go ahead, I'm gonna add a map and I'm gonna add hazardous waste. 
and bet you didn't know there was that much hazardous waste around you, but those are all the hazardous waste sites that exist in this area. So this is obviously Massachusetts right here. And then let's just go ahead and add in public housing and let's add in subsidized housing. And look at where that all starts to, starts to track. You'll notice it's not by chance that some of these areas, and it's still loading data here, some of these areas, okay, where you find high concentrations of toxic waste sites, you also find subsidized housing and housing, okay, where you find a high percentage of people of color. And so if you weren't sure if it was really true, um, you've got actual data here that was funded by the EPA to show you that oftentimes where you find these types of housing, you also find um, not, not just in the area, but directly, basically right on top, you find different types of toxic waste sites and such. And so the EPA decided to put together this office called the Office of Environmental Justice. Yay, now it's, two, it's 2015. And they also put together a calendar. And this calendar shows you, you know, it's the Environmental Justice Calendar. And what it shows you is, it shows you basically what they're doing about environmental justice, what they're doing about environmental racism. Are there grants available? Are there speaking engagements that you can go to? Are there video chats that you can get involved in? And basically what happens is the calendar ends in 2016. And there's talk about putting together another calendar, but for the most part, from what I can see, the calendar ends in 2016. And not only does it end in 2016, but then the administration says, you know what? We're gonna cut the funding for the Office of Environmental Justice, that particular part of the EPA that's devoted to environmental justice, that's devoted to helping with environmental racism. And they say, we're gonna cut it, not just a little bit, we're gonna cut it completely. There's no need for funding for that. And they weren't completely successful. They, they only ended up cutting, only ended up cutting about 70% of their funding. So grants for studying these types of scenarios went away. Money that was necessary to look into environmental health disparities, that went away as well. And not only did that go away, but data collection and analysis started to go away. Okay? Basically, people started to disavow science. They started to say, well, we don't know if we can really trust the science that was generated from some of these grants and some of this money and such. So we're just going to say it might not necessarily be true. Okay. And then on top of that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to eliminate or at least decrease some of the emissions and the pollution standards that will harm communities and overwhelmingly harm communities of color. And so that obviously took a downturn when you're talking about um, this health disparities and you're talking about environmental racism um, in anything like that in general. And if, uh, if you need an example, I provided one. And that is um, talking about nitrogen dioxide. This is the chemical we mentioned beforehand that's released when you burn coal at very high temperatures. So when you see these smokestacks that I showed you in the second slide, these are not only releasing coal dust, but they're releasing nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide not only causes cardiac issues, but it also causes respiratory issues. And those respiratory issues that it causes uh, not only are insidious and, and can be chronic uh, in themselves, but they also allow for a greater potential for you to get a bacterial infection, like a bacterial pneumonia or something like that. And we know that people of color are disproportionately located or housed near where these facilities are beat. In fact, 39% of people that live within three miles of a coal plant are people of color, and yet only 36% of the U.S. population are people of color. And if you want to see more, um, the United States Coalition of Concerned Scientists, this is their website. I believe there's over a hundred different examples of how we're moving in the wrong direction and we're eliminating these standards. We're um, taking funding away uh, that could fund studies that show us that this is actually still happening and happening in, all over the United States. And so change is still necessary. I'm sort of wrapping up my talk here. Change is still definitely necessary. We know that children that go to school that are geographically close to facilities that are known polluters, we know that the two pro, um, strongest factors that will predict this are race and poverty. We know that people of color are more likely to live in urban heat islands. These are the areas that don't have green spaces. And so plants 
and uh, grass and, and, and all sorts of things like that, that go through transpiration and act as this uh, environmental air conditioner, if you will, they're not there. So people that live in these heat islands, people of color mostly that live in these heat islands are more likely to suffer the effects of overwhelming heat in the summer, especially if they live in a city. And it gets, it gets even one step further. You are more likely, if you are Hispanic or African American, to be struck by a car and killed than you are if you're white, specifically because you don't have adequate sidewalks. This comes down to something as simple as just having adequate sidewalks, for God's sakes. And yet, because your communities don't have the funding to either maintain upkeep or put in sidewalks, you are more likely to be struck and killed by a car. And so what do you do? Well, you have to switch the narrative. You have to switch how people are thinking about this stuff. And you have to stop saying, well, how much harm can I allow versus how little harm is possible, okay? And instead of looking at treatment, let's look at prevention. Instead of looking at purely treating people that are exposed to pollutants and toxins and all sorts of things like that that can negatively affect your health, let's look towards actually preventing this from happening. And let's take some of the funding that we have okay, and give it to areas okay, that are disproportionately affected by pollutants. These are people that are disproportionately affected by toxins, by fumes, vapors, anything that can possibly harm your health, oftentimes that health is respiratory. And in some cases that health um, leads to cardiac, or excuse me, those toxins lead to cardiac issues as well. Internally, worker right to know laws, people have to know what PPE, what personal protective equipment is at their disposal so that if they're working in a place that has chemicals, that has toxins, that has volatile compounds, compounds that can get into the air that are necessarily toxic to humans, people have to know what can they use, what equipment is available for them to stay safe in their job. Could we issue larger fines to companies okay, that pollute the environment? Can we use more science to understand where the restrictions should be? Could we fund communities better so they can afford people that can say, we are being disproportionately affected by toxins, pollutants, things in the air and such. They can hire doctors, scientists, lawyers, you know, people like that that can tell you, basically these people are being affected disproportionately and we have to stop this from happening. And we have to stop restricting science. Okay, absolutely. This is where the data comes in and this is how we know that environmental racism is actually something that's functioning and functioning very heavily in, in our community. And so I'm going to sort of go back to where I was beforehand and I'm going to tell you that um, Robert D. Bullard is the man. If you want to know anything more about environmental justice, uh, please do go to his website. Um, he has published, I don't even remember how many books and papers, but it, it's quite substantial and such. And so from there, I wanted to, to, to end it off. I know it's a little bit early, but I wanted to end it off to see if there were any, any questions about sort of my journey uh, through environmental racism or um, any questions you have about the data, I'll do my best. Again, I'm a person who studies viruses, not this information, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Thank you. You have a question from Randon Davis. Go ahead. No, I, I think Megan's going to unmute Randon. And then you can also use the chat box as well if you have questions. Hi, Dr. Hogan. Randon. How are you? I'm you know, I had, a, um, I had a question. Um, being a veteran, I have noticed that throughout the 14 years that I've spent in the military, I apologize for the background noise. It's my three-year-old. Okay. Um, I'm just going to walk in another room real quick. Apologize about that. Um, so during that time, um, and you know, throughout everything that I've learned in these classes going through Regis, it um, it, it uh, started beginning to dawn on me that um, the amount of money that the government spends on military expenditures just in 2015 alone was approximately 54%. And 
with that being said, being a veteran, I've actually taken part in witnessing how different uh, military installations would actually throw away enormous caches of unused um, military equipment and, and um, probably tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition, all, all different kinds of things you could possibly think of that have never even been used still in the plastic. And I just think that, um, you know, this is brought to mind that maybe there's some way that we could advocate in this instance pertaining to this class that some of this money that's obviously getting way overspent towards military, you know, military um, aspect of this, that this, these funds could be shifted in a different direction and be put to better use. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. If they're, if you're wasting materials and such, and you have, I mean, government money is one of those guaranteed, you know, caches of money. So if you've, if you've got the ability to transfer that over um, to something else that's more beneficial to the population, I, I say, of, of course. Um, and the other thing is, is you're, you're just ended up, I don't know if they're storing this material or if they're just ended up throwing it away or both. But again, I bet a lot of that material is potentially toxic to the environment and the people that are in that environment. So it's, it's something um, that I, I think you have a good point. I think you want to look into um, less waste, uh, less waste going into the environment and less waste affecting people in general. I, I agree. But, um, you know, I, I actually raised this point to my, my battalion commander before, but, you know, things have a way of getting swept underneath the rug sure. being, you know, the low man on the totem pole. Sure. And, um, you know, but it was just unreal. I mean, I would see bulletproof vests and boxes upon boxes of uniforms still not even taken out of the boxes being thrown in dumpsters um, yeah. even in Germany and in, in Iraq Afghanistan just stuff just left in the desert and you know even in Germany just rounds and rounds of you know uh, bandoliers of ammunition just thrown thrown into the bushes yeah no that's that definitely I imagine going to have some sort of environmental effect Professor right. Hogan, yes, um, we do have some questions that have appeared in the chat. If if it's time to move on to those, yes, sure. All right. So one of the questions is, what can we do to make a change at Regis or as college students in general? Uh, that's an amazing question. Um, I think you can you know start out by one acknowledging the fact that there is you know the need for environmental justice and more specifically environmental racism. Um, you know, you're welcome to look into um, to these slides. And, and again, I, I point you further to um, Robert D. Bullard and looking at uh, his website. And there is a section there, you know, basically it's a how can I help um, section. And again, it, it, it surrounds an awful lot of ed education, just acknowledging um, that, that this exists and just letting people know and getting your voice heard. Um, it connects to healthcare disparity. It does, connects to all sorts of other disparities. So you could even say, you know, you're into, you know, looking into healthcare disparities. Regis has, you know, public health. They've got an enormous nursing department and such. Healthcare disparity and environmental justice are linked to one another. So sort of broadening your scope and saying, okay, I understand that there's healthcare disparity and I want to help. Just, just by doing that, you're automatically helping. And I know Regis, again, has a large, um, healthcare-based student population. So we could already be doing something in the sense that we're looking at healthcare disparity. Now let's make it go a little bit further and link it more directly to environmental justice, I think would be a good place to start. I okay, and we have a, another question here, connecting this to the pandemic. So mm -hmm. the, the question is, I'll read it. Can you give one specific application of this to the pandemic and the health disparities observed? And there's a, a follow-up question, if I may, what particular symptoms of the virus and of mortality attributed to environmental racism can you explain? So, so I think just in general, um, there's, there's a lot of different data. Um, there's some actually recent data that has showed that uh, people of color are overwhelmingly, or excuse me, disproportionately infected with this virus um, <clears throat> in this pandemic that we're living in right now. 
And so, so the, uh, a specific example, I don't really have one off the top. I can't say, you know, it's 58% or 26% or something like that. But I can tell you that um, there's a number of different places. One place you could go is this woman, again, Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones. Um, there's data on there. There's plenty of data on there that, tell, that gives you actual, you know, physical numbers and such and shows you how people of color are being disproportionately infected by this virus. As far as symptomo symptomology and, and mortality go, um, I, don't, I don't see uh, the data. So, so this is that. So you're back in my wheelhouse, which is great uh, for me. Um, I don't see a whole lot as far as genetic data that point towards an increase or decrease in symptomology that's based on, on race. And I'm not surprised about that. Um, race and genetics are not really that, that tied into to one another. It's more so an individual's genetics versus you know, if, if they're African-American or they're um, Latinx or, or something along those lines. So I think you're not necessarily seeing, uh, and maybe you are, maybe there is data out there and somebody knows about it, um, data that shows that symptomology is either increasing or decreasing depending on you know, um, race or, or, or some other uh, socioeconomic factor. What I can tell you is that plain and simple, if you're more likely to get infected um, and there is no other factor that's controlling whether or not you get infected other than you know, your race and what have you, then you're more likely to not only go through morbidity, which is sickness, but then experience mortality as well, which is, which is death. So there's just, as far as I know, a direct link. It is causal, but there's a direct link between getting infected, obviously, and dying from the disease. And if you're more likely to get infected because you're Black or Latinx or something like that, then I would imagine you're more likely to die from this illness as well. So this next question is, is a big one, uh, but in one of the videos, you know, it mentioned redlining, it mentioned education. And so the question is, do you think that eliminating something like standardized testing as um, uh, an admissions requirement would help minimize socioeconomic inequality? That's a, that's a huge question. And I bet I, it's a great question. And I bet there's a, no, a number of people that are on this, this, this call right now um, or this presentation that could answer it better than I. Um, I will tell you just very initially, I am all for eliminating um, standard education, uh, standard education, standard, standard testing and such, um, specifically because I don't do well on standard tests. Uh, I do much better on in-class tests and, and things like that. Um, you know, the standardized test gained even more movement with the, the no child left behind idea, which is, you know, in some ways, um, you know, it's, it's absurd. Uh, you're, you're gonna put together a standardized test, but you're not going to give people of color uh, the money and the funding that they need in order to perform well on these standardized tests. It's sort of like this idea of being colorblind. It's forgetting that there are disparities that exist beforehand. So do I know for a fact um, that removing standardized tests would do something? I don't know if any, anybody knows this. I, I do know that I would be in favor of it specifically because there aren't really standard. I mean, they are standard in the sense that they're given across different demographics and it's the same test and stuff, but they're not given across demographics that experience the same wealth that experience the same funding and such. So I can't imagine that they're doing anything good for, for people of color, but again, not 100% in my, in my wheelhouse here. I hope that answered it even slightly. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so this, so this now speaks to, to your journey and you started with the journey at the beginning of the talk. What recommendations do you have for faculty who might be uncertain as to where to start when addressing race or racism in their courses when this isn't something they've done before? Um, I don't really know <laughs> how everybody res would respond to that sort of question. I know that um, if you ask my wife, you will find out that I am uh, I'm a rule follower. And so when Audrey Grace said to do this, I took it as I, I have to do this. Um, and so I, I just it literally Googled environmental racism. Um, where can you start? you can start literally by by googling something that you know is is maybe more in your you know your specialty and such um you know you're you're teaching something on on one particular topic uh just literally going to google and saying you know how can i link this topic to racism or racial injustice or, or something along those lines i think it sounds kind of silly in a way but i think it's a really good way 
to getting yourself an understanding of what exists globally so that you can work it down in uh, a more specific sort of way and understand where you want to focus. So I think literally, you know, the world's your oyster, you're sort of, you know, what do I teach? What do I specialize in? I'm going to see if I can connect that like I did environmental racism. I mean, that's, I just Googled that to see if it was, was something. And obviously it ended up turning into this talk. So I, I think taking whatever you're good at, whatever you really understand, uh, whatever you're sort of a virtuoso at, and then linking it to this healthcare disparity, linking it to racism and sort of paring it down. And, and, and the other thing is, is, is finding the experts, you know, seeing, you know, looking at TED Med Talks, you know, this was one of the first things I did, looking at Dr. David Williams and said, wow, there's a wealth of information out there from this man. He's done studies, you know, that span years and years and years. There must be data for me to get into. And then looking at people that are sort of very diversified in their, in their focus, like Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones and saying, you know, she, did look into COVID-19. She does look into food disparity. She does look into green spaces and such. And just finding out, you know, what is what what is something that 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 resonates with you. And then, you know, whether or not you need to put together an entire lecture, you know, that's completely up to you. I just, for me, I just it was I was it was I couldn't believe that I didn't know anything about it. And I just couldn't believe that I I, I just needed to know more and more. And so that's the the avenue that I walked down but I'm sure it would work in many different ways for other professors. So we had a raised hand before. Becky, do you still have a question that you'd like to ask? Well, I was gonna address the, the question too. Uh, Regis is coming forth with a, a bunch of task force in uh, DEI. And so I think the, the big thing is to, to think big and start small. So just getting people aware of, you know, what does your syllabus look like? Who are the people who wrote all your textbooks? <laughs> um, I, I don't require it anymore, but I used to require a book called Even the Rat Was White uh, to talk about in History and Systems of Psychology. And so not even reading the book, but just pointing to the title of the book and talking about that. So I think there are ways that we can we can take little steps just to start the conversation moving forward. And I'm really sorry because I have another meeting at seven, but thank you for calling on me right at the perfect time. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you, Ben. So that's all of the questions at the moment in the chat, but I see a hand, yeah. Deborah wants, yes, yes. go hi. ahead. Hi, yes, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Debbie Beck and I'm a former uh, professor of social work at Wheelock College and I used to teach human behavior in the social environment. And this, back in the, I, I discovered this topic in 1993 and I wanna share with you two resources, Shannon, that I think you might be interested in. I discovered the topic um, from a video that was produced here at WGBH with Ira Flato, who is a very well-known public broadcasting science journalist. And he produced a video called Earth Keeping, Toxic Racism. It was the first video on this topic and it started with the Warren County um, oh, okay. This, you know, the civil unrest that, that the, the march that you talked about, and it's brilliant. And you can probably, it's in the archives at WGBH and you can okay. probably access it through them. And I, I just used it in my teaching for 25, 30 years till I retired. Um, the other is that there's an organization here in Boston that is important for people to know about. Um, Action for, let's see, I, I, just, I just Googled it and I have it here. Alternatives for Community and Environment, ACE. And they're in Roxbury and they've been working very, very actively on this topic for many years and have dealt with the um, pollutants that are in Roxbury in the, uh, the, the bus, the school bus lots and, and all of the pollutants that affect kids that, are, that contribute to the asthma and all of the other diseases. And it's a very a good grassroots community organization for people to know about. So those are the, the two resources I wanted to share. And thank you, this is a wonderful talk. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, so I'm seeing um, this, this was just to me. Um, the question is, this is a fantastic question um, from Lisa McCluskey and it says, 
Um, thinking about the map you showed in the areas of toxic waste, do you know what happens when those areas are quote unquote gentrified? I think that's an amazing question. And the answer is, I simply don't know um, the answer to that, but it's something I, I want to look into because I do wonder, you know, what happens? I mean, do they start putting greater emissions on the, they don't move the coal plants. I don't, I don't know if they do or they shut them down and they move them to someplace else. Um, I, I don't know. Do they make toxic emission standards even greater or the rules and regulations become a little bit tighter? Uh, I'm, I'm not actually hundred percent sure, but I think that's an absolutely fantastic question. And then just, just, just one last thing. Um, so when I was in, when I was in industry, they tell you um, when you're putting together a talk, make sure there's, um, make, make sure there's a, an obvious, obvious question. Make sure you, you know, put a layup out there, so to speak. Uh, and, and, I, and I tried to and nobody took it. And so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and be unabashed and tell you about it anyways. So the reason why the talk is called uh, Mercy, Mercy Me is that's a song by um, the incomparable Marvin Gaye. And it's one of the only, um, it's one of the only, songs I can think of, so one, it's Marvin Gaye, so it's fantastic, but it's one of the only songs that I can think of that talks about um, environmental pollution. I mean, the parentheses after mercy, mercy me is the ecology. And, and, and so why I think it, it partially speaks to environmental racism is the name of the album is What's Going On. And What's Going On is an album, it's a concept album, and it's an album about um, a Black Vietnam War vet coming back to, um, to his community and seeing all the disparity in the community. And I just, I have to wonder if some of that disparity uh, is linked to environmental racism. I mean, he talks right in the song about, you know, fish having mercury in them um, and the pollution that's in the sea. And so the reason why the talk is named Mercy, Mercy Me is because it's about the only song that I could think of that sort of has maybe not a direct, but an indirect link to in, in environmental racism and, and that, and it's a, it's a fantastic song as well. So that's why the talk was named that. Shannon, I'd like to ask the question, is there any silver lining here? Um, you know, our, our theme this year is harsh disparities and obviously you've really showed us in many ways, the harsh disparities around environmental racism. But I'm sitting here wondering, um, you know, that this pandemic as awful as it has been and the disparities have just been so glaring. I, I wonder, I hope, I guess, my hope is that, at, that these issues will be elevated to a place where people actually pay way, 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 way more attention and um, actually act to eradicate so much of this? Um, yeah, <clears throat> I can tell you that, you know, from what I've seen so far, unfortunately, um, you know, it, it's, it's trending in the wrong direction. As I was saying, you know, earlier in some of my slides that, you know, the funding is, is being cut. Um, the regulations are being lowered. The standards are being lowered. Science is not being, let's just say, appreciated, or you could use the word disavowed. Um, quite a, 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 as, as much as it should be, or at least appreciate as much as it should be. And, and this is really where we get the data. This is really where we get the understanding. I mean, you can argue all you want and use, you know, I feel this, I feel this, so on and so forth. When, when you start coming in with data, when you start coming in with actual numbers um, that make it quite obvious that there is a glaring uh, environmental racism that pervades, not only in this country, but, uh, but across the world. Unfortunately, it's tracking in, in the wrong direction. I think I think the positive, if, if you want to sort of be Sunshine Shannon and see if you can find a positive in this, um, is that it's being acknowledged. And I think that's the first part of change, is that people are acknowledging that um, not just environmental racism, but environmental pollution in general is something that's in affecting the lives of, of, of virtually everybody out there, but again, disproportionately to people of color. So I think the sheer acknowledgement that this is actually happening is, is something that's that's um, important in the beginning. It obviously needs to trend forward. And I think places like Regis, which are acknowledging um, racism and, and, and racial disparity and such like that are, are thankfully not the only ones that are doing this. Um, so so I, I, think, I think that acknowledgement is, is something that's, that's really important. I wish it was go, I wish I could give you a better answer and that it was moving forward, but not, not from what I can see. 
We do have another question from John Teagan. So if you want to go ahead and ask, you, you're free to. Well, thank you. Uh, as, as the chairman of the board, I want to thank you all for putting this together. And I want to thank uh, the audience for listening and asking such great questions. But in answer to one of the questions of, that asked Dr. Hogan, what can we do? I think each of us knows what we can do from the smallest to the largest, as long as we're well aware that this goes on. And as long as we take our vote seriously in the coming election, and as long as we keep working for justice, and we do not let the world take its place without us. We have a voice and you're at a great institution and every, if everyone does their work, I think we can affect change. And I wanna thank uh, Mary Lou, Dr. Jackson and Dr. Hayes and everybody else and uh, that is doing things to bring these situations in front of us so that we're aware. You know, many times we go through our lives and we don't know what's going on. Now we've been made aware and it's up to us to change what's happening. That's all I have to say, but thanks for listening. Thank you, John. You're welcome, doctor. Thank you, John. Anyone else got a question? Okay. Well, I didn't mean to put a pail on the place. <laughs> oh, no, no, you're fine. <laughs> Way to drop the mood. Uh, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> no, no, I think it was wrap. I think it, honestly, I think it was wrapping up um, at that it was point. Action, and it was a call to action. That's what we need to hear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's that. Um, Mary Lou did ask me, to let you know that this is only one in a series of lectures that are going to continue to focus on um, issues like racism and, and, and such. And so um, please tune in further. I think um, you know the links that you found this talk on, you'll be able to find other links on uh, on the future talks as well. And with that, I bid you a great night. I, I just wanna thank you, Dr. Hogan. Thank you. We appreciate you kicked off